Hi, my name is Nick and I'm the Creative Director at, here at Outright Games and I'd like to share some tips with you on the creation of the design doc for your game jam. Firstly and most importantly, remember the purpose of the GDD. It's a way to communicate the vision of the game to your whole team. Games are made by groups of individuals and have different ideas and different uh, ways of expressing them. Being able to collaborate and share a common vision is vital as well as the best part of development, in my opinion. Try and think of a few key phrases, sometimes known as pillars, that the game will be based on. These should sum up the concepts that you're trying to convey and should also be a collection of simple words, building or combat, or perhaps a brief sentence or phrase like high-octane racing or a charming puzzler. These help keep the design focused as well as provide guidance to the team. All GDDs should really be a list of rules that explain how the game is going to be played, won or lost. All games, be they card, board or video, need rules to operate and be enjoyed by their players. They are vital as nearly all games have a win or lose scenario. That could be coming first in a race, surviving an alien horde or rescuing a prince or princess. Consider what form the game is going to take. Will it be broken up into a series of levels? as often these can be very highly detailed, enabling you to focus more on specific story events or locations. Alternatively, if you want to have more of an open or exploratory world, setting it in an open world will allow you to achieve that, although perhaps with a little less specificity of detail in any one location. Think about the challenge mechanisms that you want to include in the game. Most games are based around skill, and so how does the player get better at the game? Does the AI need to improve its targeting? Do new enemies need to appear? Or simply the amount of existing ones increase? If you have dialogue choices, how will they make a meaningful impact in the game? Similarly, how will the player feel like they're progressing? Like any good piece of entertainment, the player needs to go on a rewarding journey with a, with a video game. Will they be able to unlock faster cars or more in challenging tracks? Will new quests appear if you rescue a character? Perhaps the items that you collect allow you to upgrade your powers and abilities. This can often tie in with a learning curve so that players' relative power waxes and wanes as they progress through the title. For example, they buy a fantastic racing car that enables them to come first in all the races. But then you introduce new weather conditions or a different track and suddenly the rules have changed and there are new challenges for them to master. Ensuring sufficient reward, progression and challenge is key to helping keeping the player engaged. Lastly, for what a GDD should include, is a consideration if the game is single, multiplayer or both. If it's multiplayer, is that just local? So friends sitting together on the couch, playing in split screen? Or is it over the internet? If it's online or offline, how will the players play? Will they be collaborative or competitive? If it's both single and multiplayer, are there separate challenges for the different modes? Does progress in one area unlock new, uh, new items for the, the other area? like maps or locations in the story mode becoming available to play multiplayer. Equally, I think it's also important to consider what a GDD should not be. For example, it shouldn't be a description of what the first 15 minutes of gameplay is. Sure, that info can be vital later on in development, as understanding initial user experience is key to making a great game. But at the start of development, it can be a distraction when the whole game needs to be considered in the round. Avoid creating a list of games of similar style or genre that you'd like to play. Whilst comparisons and inspiration are vital, your experiences are subjective and could differ from someone else on your team. One person's idea of a fun driving game might be Mario Kart, another's maybe Gran Turismo, very different games. So try adding specifics to what you want to include or not include in your examples, such as like Mario Kart for drifting, handling, accessibility, unlike Mario Kart for damage modeling, crafting, and upgrading.
This way you're able to share your vision for the game with a team who need to go away and build it. If the people are going off in different directions right from the start, you're going to be in trouble. Doubtless you guys are filled with enthusiasm about exciting prospect you're having. But guard against making the biggest and most all-encompassing game you can imagine. Invariably, unless you've got pots of money, a game design needs to be constrained by three things. Firstly, time you have to make it. Games that are too large or overcomplicated run the risk of falling out of fashion, becoming bloated or falling behind the technical advances of the day. It always takes longer than you think to make a game. So ensure that you remain focused, realistic and detailed in what you want to do and how long you think it will take to achieve it. Secondly, game designers need to consider the amount of people and skills that you have in your team. Think about the team you have or would like to have and strike a balance between their complementary skills. If a game is too heavily detailed and filled with nice, beautiful scenery, will it be able to run at a steady frame rate and feel nice to play? Conversely, if everything is optimised but dull and lifeless, people are going to struggle to enjoy it. Getting a GDD right is as much about understanding your team's strengths and weaknesses as anything else. Thirdly, and lastly, and inevitably, how large or small is the game budget going to be? Unless you're very lucky, making games is a business and being disciplined in your approach will be vital. It doesn't need to be thought of as a constraint. Limitless funds do not make the ultimate game. In fact, Flappy Birds was made on a shoestring budget but became a global sensation. During all these stages, don't forget to refer back to your initial key pillars and make sure that your team have all bought into them and agree on the framework that they create. It's very easy to get distracted and over-design a game. Not only will it make, this, it'll make it longer to make and harder to play, it'll dilute the concept and not be a clear and succinct experience for the player. It's always better to have a smaller, more polished game than something with bold ambitions that ultimately can't be achieved. Remember, all thriller, no filler is a good guideline here. Another common pitfall is not fully understanding who the game's aimed at. What's the audience? What do they want? Understanding this will be vital to the type of game you're making. Using the racing analogy again, if you're making a game for young kids, you need to think about less complex controls, not quite so many options, but plenty of rewards and relatively gentle learning curve. Conversely, if your audience is older, you should consider skill elements far more and how the older player is going to be challenged and engaged from early on. Again, using some examples here can be a good shorthand to explain these concepts to the rest of the team. Just check that the examples you use are well known and not being misunderstood. Finally, consider the device you think this game is going to be played on. It's fantastic that there are so many different ways to play games now. But these devices are all accessed at different times and in different locations. For example, phone games need to be played in short bursts, as people playing them are generally on the move. They come with quick iterations and rewards and a staccato sense of gameplay. The controls, too, typically need to be very simple, often involving one finger or thumb. Alternatively, console games have dedicated controllers, are generally played in a more relaxed environment, like a bedroom or living room, and so can offer longer and more engaging gameplay sessions. In short, game design is a collaborative process and the best games are made by a wide variety of people coming together and working in a team. Yep, all teams need leadership and creatively someone does need to hold the collective vision and carry it forward. So making games can be challenging, time-consuming and frustrating, but they also allow you to share your creative vision with a group of like-minded individuals who... They can all express themselves in their own way. We'll create something that thousands of players from all over the world will love to play. I hope these tips help you on your own design in the game jam. And who knows? Take these learnings on into your own career as the game designers of the future. Thanks very much. Yeah.